Lesson 10. Doing the Unthinkable. Sabbath afternoon, February 27. The plan for our redemption was not an afterthought, a plan formulated after the fall of Adam. It was a revelation of the mystery which hath been kept in silence through times eternal. Romans chapter 16, verse 25, Revised Version. It was an unfolding of the principles that from eternal ages have been the foundation of God's throne. From the beginning, God and Christ knew of the apostasy of Satan and of the fall of man through the deceptive power of the apostate. God did not ordain that sin should exist, but he foresaw its existence and made provision to meet the terrible emergency. So great was his love for the world that he covenanted to give his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John chapter 3, verse 16. This was a voluntary sacrifice. Jesus might have remained at the Father's side. He might have retained the glory of heaven and the homage of the angels. But he chose to give back the scepter into the Father's hands and to step down from the throne of the universe that he might bring light to the benighted and life to the perishing. The Desire of Ages, pages 22 and 23. For the first time, the child Jesus looked upon the temple. He saw the white-robed priests performing their solemn ministry. He beheld the bleeding victim upon the altar of sacrifice. With the worshipers, he bowed in prayer while the cloud of incense ascended before God. He witnessed the impressive rites of the Paschal service. Day by day, he saw their meaning more clearly. Every act seemed to be bound up with his own life. New impulses were awakening within him. Silent and absorbed, he seemed to be studying out a great problem. The mystery of his mission was opening to the Savior. The Desire of Ages, page 78. Paul showed how closely God had linked the sacrificial service with the prophecies relating to the one who was to be brought as a lamb to the slaughter. The Messiah was to give his life as an offering for sin. Looking down through the centuries to the scenes of the Savior's atonement, the prophet Isaiah had testified that the Lamb of God poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Isaiah chapter 53 verses 7, 10, and 12. The Savior of prophecy was to come, not as a temporal king to deliver the Jewish nation from earthly oppressors, but as a man among men to live a life of poverty and humility and at last to be despised, rejected, and slain. The Savior foretold in the Old Testament scriptures was to offer himself as a sacrifice in behalf of the fallen race, thus fulfilling every requirement of the broken law. In him, the sacrificial types were to meet their antitype, and his death on the cross was to lend significance to the entire Jewish economy. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 227 and 228. Sunday, February 28. Isaiah's Testing Truth The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Not for himself, but for others, he lived and thought and prayed. From hours spent with God, he came forth morning by morning to bring the light of heaven to men. Daily he received a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. In the early hours of the new day, the Lord awakened him from his slumbers, and his soul and his lips were anointed with grace that he might impart to others. His words were given him fresh from the heavenly courts, words that he might speak in season to the weary and oppressed. The Lord God hath given me, he said, the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4. Christ's Object Lessons, page 139.
It was to bring the bread of life to his enemies that our Savior left his home in heaven. Though calumny and persecution were heaped upon him from the cradle to the grave, they called forth from him only the expression of forgiving love. Through the prophet Isaiah, he says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6. The blow that is aimed at him falls upon the Savior who surrounds him with his presence. Whatever comes to him comes from Christ. He has no need to resist evil, for Christ is his defense. Nothing can touch him except by our Lord's permission, and all things that are permitted work together for good to them that love God. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 71. He saved others, himself he cannot save. Mark chapter 15, verse 31. It is because Christ would not save himself that the sinner has any hope of pardon or favor with God. If, in his undertaking to save the sinner, Christ had failed or become discouraged, the last hope of every son and daughter of Adam would have been at an end. The entire life of Christ was one of self-denial and self-sacrifice. Oh, what soul hunger and longing had Christ to save that which was lost! The body crucified upon the cross did not detract from his divinity, his power of God to save through the human sacrifice, all who accept his righteousness. In dying upon the cross, he transferred the guilt from the person of the transgressor to that of the divine substitute through faith in him as his personal redeemer. This Day with God, page 236. Monday. March 1. The Suffering Servant Poem Christ was not insensible to ignominy and disgrace. He felt it all most bitterly. He felt it as much more deeply and acutely than we can feel suffering, as his nature was more exalted and pure and holy than that of the sinful race for whom he suffered. He was the majesty of heaven, he was equal with the Father. He was the commander of the hosts of angels, yet he died for man, the death that was above all others, clothed with ignominy and reproach. Oh, that the haughty hearts of men might realize this. Oh, that they might enter into the meaning of redemption and seek to learn the meekness and lowliness of Jesus. That I may know him. Page 339. Who can comprehend the love here displayed? The angelic host beheld with wonder and with grief him who had been the majesty of heaven and who had worn the crown of glory, now wearing the crown of thorns, a bleeding victim to the rage of an infuriated mob, fired to insane madness by the wrath of Satan. Behold the patient sufferer. Upon his head is the thorny crown. His lifeblood flows from every lacerated vein. All this in consequence of sin. Nothing could have induced Christ to leave his honor and majesty in heaven and come to a sinful world to be neglected, despised, and rejected by those he came to save and finally to suffer upon the cross, but eternal redeeming love, which will ever remain a mystery. While the nails were being driven through his hands and the sweat drops of agony were forced from his pores, from the pale, quivering lips of the innocent sufferer, a prayer of pardoning love was breathed for his murderers. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. All heaven was gazing with profound interest upon the scene. The glorious Redeemer of a lost world was suffering the penalty of man's transgression of the Father's law. He was about to ransom his people with his own blood. He was paying the just claims of God's holy law. This was the means through which an end was to be finally made of sin and Satan, and his host to be vanquished. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, pages 207 to 209. The humanity of the Son of God is everything to us. 
It is the golden chain that binds our souls to Christ and through Christ to God. This is to be our study. Christ was a real man. He gave proof of his humility in becoming a man. Yet he was God in the flesh. When we approach this subject, we would do well to heed the words spoken by Christ to Moses at the burning bush. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Exodus chapter 3 verse 5. We should come to this study with the humility of a learner with a contrite heart, and the study of the incarnation of Christ is a fruitful field which will repay the searcher who digs deep for hidden truth. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 244. Tuesday, March 2. Who has believed? It is by suffering that our virtues are tested and our faith tried. It is in the day of trouble that we feel the preciousness of Jesus. You will be given opportunity to say, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job chapter 13 verse 15 Oh, it is so precious to think that opportunities are afforded us to confess our faith in the face of danger and amid sorrow, sickness, pain, and death. With us, everything depends on how we accept the Lord's terms. As is our spirit, so will be the moral result upon our future life and character. Each individual soul has victories to gain, but he must realize that he cannot have things just as he wants them. We are to observe carefully every lesson Christ has given throughout his life and teaching. He does not destroy. He improves whatever he touches. Selected Messages, Book 1, pages 117 and 118. Do not talk of your lack of faith and your sorrows and sufferings. The tempter delights to hear such words. When talking on gloomy subjects, you are glorifying him. We are not to dwell on the great power of Satan to overcome us. Often we give ourselves into his hands by talking of his power. Let us talk instead of the great power of God to bind up all our interests with his own. Tell of the matchless power of Christ and speak of his glory. All heaven is interested in our salvation. The angels of God, thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand, are commissioned to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. They guard us against evil and press back the powers of darkness that are seeking our destruction. Have we not reason to be thankful every moment, thankful even when there are apparent difficulties in our pathway? The Ministry of Healing, pages 253 and 254. Our Lord says, Remember that I died for you. When oppressed and persecuted and afflicted for my sake and the Gospels, remember my love, so great that for you I gave my life. When your duties appear stern and severe and your burdens too heavy to bear, remember that for your sake I endured the cross, despising the shame. When your heart shrinks from the trying ordeal, Remember that your Redeemer liveth to make intercession for you. These are the things we are never to forget. The love of Jesus with its constraining power is to be kept fresh in our memory. There can be no union between our souls and God except through Christ. The union and love between brother and brother must be cemented and rendered eternal by the love of Jesus. And nothing less than the death of Christ could make his love efficacious for us. It is only because of his death that we can look with joy to his second coming. His sacrifice is the center of our hope. Upon this, we must fix our faith. The Desire of Ages, pages 659 and 660. Wednesday, March 3. The Unreachable is Us. A short time before, Jesus had stood like a mighty cedar, withstanding the storm of opposition that spent its fury upon him. Stubborn wills and hearts filled with malice and subtlety had striven in vain to confuse and overpower him. He stood forth in divine majesty as the Son of God. Now he was like a reed beaten and bent by the angry storm. 
He had approached the consummation of his work, a conqueror, having at each step gained the victory over the powers of darkness. As one already glorified, he had claimed oneness with God. In unfaltering accents, he had poured out his songs of praise. He had spoken to his disciples in words of courage and tenderness. Now had come the hour of the power of darkness. Now his voice was heard on the still evening air, not in tones of triumph, but full of human anguish. O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. The Desire of Ages, pages 689 and 690. The heart of God yearns over his earthly children with a love stronger than death. In giving up his Son, he has poured out to us all heaven in one gift. The Savior's life and death and intercession, the ministry of angels, the pleading of the Spirit, the Father working above and through all, the unceasing interest of heavenly beings, all are enlisted in behalf of man's redemption. Oh, let us contemplate the amazing sacrifice that has been made for us. Let us try to appreciate the labor and energy that heaven is expending to reclaim the lost and bring them back to the Father's house. Motives stronger and agencies more powerful could never be brought into operation. The exceeding rewards for right doing, the enjoyment of heaven, the society of the angels, the communion and love of God and His Son, the elevation and extension of all our powers throughout eternal ages, are these not mighty incentives and encouragements to urge us to give the heart's loving service to our Creator and Redeemer? Steps to Christ, page 21. Christ might, because of our guilt, have moved far from us. But instead of moving farther away from us, he came and dwelt among us, filled with all the fullness of the Godhead, to be one with us, that through his grace we might attain to perfection. By a death of shame and suffering, he paid man's ransom. What self-sacrificing love is this? From the highest excellency he came, his divinity clothed with humanity, descending step by step to the very depths of humiliation. No line can measure the depth of his love. Christ has shown us how much God can love and our Redeemer suffer in order to secure our complete restoration. He desires his children to reveal his character, to exert his influence, that other minds may be drawn into harmony with his mind. The Upward Look, page 191. Thursday, March 4. A Transforming Reparation Offering. Christ our Savior, in whom dwelt absolute perfection became sin for the fallen race. He did not know sin by the experience of sinning, but he bore the terrible weight of the guilt of the whole world. He became our propitiation that all who receive him may become sons of God. The cross was erected to save man. Christ lifted on the cross was the means devised in heaven for awakening in the repenting soul a sense of the sinfulness of sin. By the cross, Christ sought to draw all to himself. He died as the only hope of saving those who, because of sin, were in the gall of bitterness. Through the agency of the Holy Spirit, a new principle of mental and spiritual power was to be brought to man, who, through association with divinity, was to become one with God. To break down the barriers that Satan had erected between God and man, Christ made a full and complete sacrifice, revealing unexampled self-denial. He revealed to the world the amazing spectacle of God living in human flesh and sacrificing himself to save fallen man. What wonderful love! The Upward Look, page 191. In all this conflict with the power of evil, there was ever before Christ the darkened shadow into which he himself must enter. Ever before him was the means by which he must pay the ransom for these souls. When he raised Lazarus from the dead, he knew that for that life he must pay the ransom on the cross of Calvary. 
Every rescue made was to cause him the deepest humiliation. He was to taste death for every man. Of the suffering multitudes brought to Christ, it is said, He healed them all. Matthew chapter 12, verse 15. Thus he expressed his love for the children of men. His miracles were part of his mission. He knows how to speak the word be whole, and when he has healed the sufferer, he says, Go and sin no more. That I may know him. Page 48. Upon Christ as our substitute and surety was laid the iniquity of us all. He was counted a transgressor that he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. The wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity, filled the soul of his son with consternation. All his life, Christ had been publishing to a fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme. But now with the terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was the sense of sin, bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute, that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. The Desire of Ages, page 753. For further reading, In Heavenly Places, Kind and Courteous Words, page 181, and That I May Know Him, Despised and Rejected, page 66.